All right, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going through the gospel according to Matthew. And in this chapter, Jesus is going to teach us about our motives. In other words, there's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way to do the exact same thing. It all comes down to our motive. Do we live by what Matthew 5.16 says? Check it out on the screen. Remember what he said there. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus assumes we will, as his children, do good works. But as we've already talked about, we do good works not to get saved, but because we are saved. But even as Christians, we need to serve the Lord in such a way that other people see more of Jesus and they see less of us. Like John the Baptist said, I must decrease. He, Jesus, must increase. We should always point people to the Lord and not draw attention to ourselves. Now, this is in sharp contrast to the religious leaders in Jesus' day. They wanted the people to notice them. They wanted the people to applaud them. They wanted the people to see their religious works and give them the glory instead of giving the glory to God. But for those of us who have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then we know that He alone deserves all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. I mean, He's the one that has done everything for us. Everything we have in our lives that's good is because of God's grace and His mercy and His love. So in this chapter, Jesus will tell us how we should live out our Christian faith and he will use the religious leaders as an example of how not to live out your Christian faith. And Jesus will call them hypocrites three times in this chapter. Now, he uses the Greek word hypocrites, which means to wear a mask. It was an actor who would put on a mask. Or when it comes to our political leaders... It refers to those who tell you, you must wear a mask, and then they don't, as they celebrate Barack's 60th birthday. <laughs> Sorry. You can't resist. I mean, it's too hard to let go. But anyway, Matthew uses the word hypocrite 15 times in his letter, and the whole Old Testament used the word hypocrite only three times. And so Jesus really zeroes in on these religious leaders. Religious hypocrisy is the worst because this is when people use religion to put on a mask or cover up their own sins while promoting themselves and telling you how to live your own life. So let's pick up in chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now take note of a couple things in this verse. First of all, this is a command he gives us when he says, take heed. He's not saying this is a suggestion. He's saying, no, we need to pay attention to this important truth. Secondly, again, because we are followers of Christ, he assumes that we will do good works for the kingdom of God. So when you do your charitable deeds, so he just assumes, because you are a new creation in Christ, all things become new, there's going to be outflow from what Christ is doing in you. And then thirdly, Jesus is letting us know that we can either receive a reward for our good deeds in the here and now, <laughs> which is not good, or you can receive your reward when you stand before the Lord in glory. In our flesh, there's always a temptation to want to be noticed and recognized and affirmed by others when we do something good or nice. There's nothing wrong with being recognized by others, but the problem comes when that affirmation becomes our motive for why we're doing what we're doing. Again, everything good in my life is because of God's grace. Without God, I am just a big giant dirt clod. Six foot three, two ten. So I'm a bigger dirt cloud than you, but you're all little dirt clouds. And you might say, well, I've got the Holy Spirit. I'm anointed. Well, then you're an anointed dirt cloud. You've got the Holy Spirit. So you're, you're a wet dirt cloud. So you're a mud piece of mud. Anyway, by the way, 17 elements make up common dirt. The exact same 17 elements make up our bodies. So that keeps you humble. The only difference between us and Adam, when God formed Adam out of the dirt of the ground, 
was he breathed the breath of life into him. And then he became a living being. And that's the same with us. We're just dirt until Jesus breathes the breath of life in us. The Holy Spirit brings us to life. And that's a whole other study. Anyway, Jesus speaks of our Father in heaven 16 times in Matthew's gospel. 12 of those times he uses the word Father in this chapter alone. Jesus will speak of rewards 13 times in this gospel, and that's what he mentions here. Now, a lot of us don't like to talk about rewards because, you know, we don't want to be noticed because we don't want people stealing our rewards and so forth. But the New Testament is clear that all of us who have received the free gift of eternal life from Christ, we will receive rewards or not receive rewards when we stand before him at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, which is only for believers. That is when you will also not be rewarded for things that you do in the flesh. Paul says in uh, both his letters to the Corinthians, notice first of all, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he's the firm foundation. We build our lives on him. He's the rock of our salvation. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, that's good stuff, wood, hay, straw, that's not good, each one's work will become clear. For the day, again, the beam of seed of Christ, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. So he's not talking about salvation there. He's talking about we're all saved. We go to the Bema seat of Christ if you're saved. But there's things we do in the Spirit when we know the Lord's leading me, the Lord's strengthening me, and I do good things. You'll get rewarded for that. He'll give you crowns for various things. What do we do with those crowns? Toss them at the feet of Jesus, because we know He alone is worthy. Things we do that might be good works, but we're doing it because we want attention, we want to be noticed, we want people to focus on us instead of Jesus, that's hay, wood, and straw. It's all going to burn up. So the goal is have the smallest pile of ashes at the beam of seat of Christ. That would be a good thing. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, For we, talking about believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the Bema seat. This is where rewards were given. This is for believers only, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done. Again, whether good, hay, wood, or the gold, silver, precious stones, or bad, that's the hay, wood, and straw. The unbelievers, they're the only ones who will stand before the great white throne judgment of God. That takes place after the millennial reign of Christ. This whole universe is going to be vaporized. There's going to be this great white throne. All unbelievers will stand before them. But that's sentencing day to the lake of fire. For believers, we will all stand before the Lord at the Bema seat. So here in Matthew 6, Jesus is telling us this is how you need to serve. This is how you need to give. This is how you need to pray and fast. Because there is great reward when you do things God's way instead of doing things like the religious hypocrites. So verse 2, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may glorify, have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. You know, we would say in the modern vernacular, don't toot your own horn. You know, don't draw attention to yourself. If that's your motive for writing that big check, I want people to see how much I'm giving. Look, I'm giving a check for $1,000. Wow, look at... And everybody's like, wow, aren't you spiritual? There's your reward. That wow is your reward here and now. You're not going to get rewarded for that in heaven. God sees that because you wanted the attention. You wanted the glory. He sees it as hay, wood, stubble, straw. That's all it is. So... We see that today with some of the flamboyant preachers. They, they still do these type of things. They'll get people to get out of your seat, wave that check, you know, and everybody makes a big spectacle out of it. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, they love to stand in the synagogue, and they would literally have somebody blow a trumpet when they're getting ready to give because they wanted all the attention on them. Jesus said, don't do that. 
There's no reward from your Father in heaven if you do things this way. Then he says in verse 3, But when you do a charitable deed, so again, assuming that we will, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Now, even though Jesus is talking to multitudes, literally thousands of people here on the mountain as he's giving this Sermon on the Mount, he uses the singular a few different times here when he says, let not your left hand. He's talking individually. He's using the singular. And he's not saying not, not yours, all you thousands. No, individually, let not your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So it's a very personal thing between you and the Lord. Again, the hypocrites do it to be seen by others, but Jesus tells us, who are children of our Heavenly Father, be quiet about it. Do it in secret, and your Father in Heaven will reward you. It's in that intimate relationship with the Lord that should be what motivates us to do what we're supposed to be doing. That should motivate us more than, oh, I want somebody to see this and you know, pat me on the back and give me the glory. Again, it takes genuine faith to really believe that God is watching. He is the one who is blessed by our actions. He will reward us when we stand before Him in glory. But so often, we want it right now. I want the attention. I want people to pat me on the back. I want this. Now, again, it's not always wrong when someone gives and others take notice of it. There's always some examples of what Jesus says here, but examples of doing it the right way, like Barnabas. Remember at the end of the book of Acts chapter 4, Barnabas, it says, sells a tract of land. And this is what it says, Acts 4, 37. Having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And when he did that, it was a tremendous blessing to the people. The people were tremendously blessed by him giving that because there were a lot of Jewish believers, Christians now, they didn't call them Christians yet, but Jewish believers, because they came to Christ, they got kicked out of the synagogue. Because they came to Christ, they got their jobs taken away. And so they were very destitute, many of them. And so when Barnabas sells this tract of land, brings it to the apostles, that was a blessing to help so many who were in genuine need. But then we have an, a, a bad example in the next few verses where it goes into chapter 5 of Acts, where Ananias and Sapphira, remember them? They see the attention Barnabas gets, and they go, wow, I want that attention as well. But their motives are wrong. They sold some land. They bring the money to the disciples. They pretend we're bringing all this money, and we're giving it all because we sold all the land, and here's, here's all of it. They wanted people to go, wow, yay. But then Peter, the Holy Spirit gave him discernment, said, you guys are lying to the Holy Spirit. You're lying to God. He says, that land was yours, the money was yours. You could have done whatever you want. You could give any portion you want. But to tell us you're giving all of it when you're keeping most of it for yourself? And they literally, it literally costs them their lives. What was the difference between Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira? It had everything to do with their motives. Barnabas just wanted to bless the people. And so he gave it all to use as the, as the apostles saw fit. But Ananias and Sapphira wanted people to think, oh, we're super spiritual and we want everybody to see what's going on here. So sad. Anyway, verse 5, Jesus speaks to the people about prayer. But when you pray, again, singular, you, even though he's talking to multitudes, he'd be pointing out you as an individual, when you as an individual pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray individually, singularly, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in the secret will reward you openly." Again, he's speaking to individuals in this group of multitudes. This is how you should pray when it's just you and the Lord. I had somebody call me out on this because it's like, well, you pray in front of the church. You're a hypocrite. And it's like, no, it's not what Jesus is talking about. There is a time and place for corporate prayer. It can be here in the church. 
It can be in our life groups, our home fellowships. It can be two or three gathered together, praying together. Nothing wrong with that. That's not what Jesus is referring to. He's referring to when you and the Lord, just you two are praying, find a quiet place. Get alone with the Lord. You know, there's time for corporate prayer, but there's time when it's just you and the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. We see numerous examples of corporate prayer in the scriptures. Remember when Peter and John, they got arrested. They were threatened by the Sanhedrin. Do not speak of that name anymore. They wouldn't even say Jesus. Don't preach in that name anymore. And they threatened him some more. And so the first thing they did was go to a prayer meeting. They run to the house. But this is what it says in Acts 4, 19 and 20. Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So after they get released, they go to this prayer meeting, and they're all praying together. The prayer is even put in there in Acts chapter 4. It's a marvelous prayer that they're all joining in, praying different parts of it. And so, this is what it, uh, how the prayer meeting ended, Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, so they're all praying together, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So that's a great example of how corporate prayer is good. But here, Jesus is referring to one-on-one -on -one prayer between you and the Lord. Don't be like the hypocrites. He's referring to what the Pharisees would do. They would go on a street corner, and they're pretending it's just me and God praying, but they pray out loud, and they wanted people to walk by and hear their prayers and go, wow, look how spiritual they are. And God's up in heaven thinking, they're not spiritual, they're in the flesh. Because they're not praying to me, they want all you guys to hear what they're saying. That's what it was all about. That's why he's calling them hypocrites. Here Jesus is encouraging us to find a quiet place. Some say the prayer closet or a prayer room. Um, you know, I've when we lived out in the Redlands and the girls were little and they were noisy, I would go out in my pickup truck. That was a great place to pray. Get alone, get a place where it's quiet. You can go, you know, out in the garden, go in your front porch. Doesn't matter. Just find a quiet place where it's just you and the Lord. So you find a place of isolation a place of intimacy where you can just hear the Lord's still small voice as you're speaking to the Lord, one-on-one. -on -one. Verse 7, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. So what is vain repetition? Well, it's saying something over and over and over again. And it's saying it over and over and over again. And then you say it some more over and over and over again. And you just keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. And pretty soon you're like, you're getting annoy annoying. Yeah. And I'm thinking God's probably like, Jeff, shut up already. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying before you ask. You don't need to keep repeating yourself. That's what the pagans do. A great example again, 1 Kings 18. This is when Elijah the prophet, he's on Mount Carmel, and the Israelites are worshiping Baal, and there's 450 prophets of Baal up there. And he puts them to the test. Okay, let's find out who the one true genuine God is. So we're going to have an altar here, and we're going to have an altar there. So you guys call upon Baal, see if he will, you know, ignite your altar and, you know, consume your sacrifice. Well, they start, it says literally from morning till noon, they repeated the same thing over and over again. For hour, four or five hours, they're just saying, oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. I mean, they over and over. That's vain repetition. Nothing happened. And so, you know, he starts mocking him. Well, maybe your God's taking, a, you know, a leave of absence. Maybe he's gone out to lunch. A few other things he mentioned. But it's, it's funny because all Elijah does after they're done, he just prays a simple prayer. He humbles himself before God, and, and he just... He said, Lord, please turn the hearts of the Israelites back to you. You know, prove yourself to them, so to speak. And God sends down fire from heaven, and it consumes not only the burnt offering, it consumes the whole altar made out of wood and stone. And all the he put hundreds of gallons of water on this thing, too. And that's all consumed by the Lord. And then all the Israelites, when they see this, they start crying out, The Lord 
Yahweh, he is God. That was the whole point. Baal couldn't do anything. Baal wasn't even real. Listen, God doesn't need many words from us to know what we are talking about. And he certainly doesn't need us saying the same words over and over again, like a Hare Krishna chant. You don't hear much about Hare Krishna people anymore, but when I was growing up in San Diego, they were always at the airport. They were always at the beach. I'd be done surfing, sitting on the beach, and they'd start nee, 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 chanting around you with their little tambourines and Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna. And it was like, I wasn't even a believer. I'm like, you guys are nuts. This is just ridiculous. And then I realized it's empty because they're just chanting something, trying to get whatever God they believed in to do something, and he doesn't. God doesn't need, nor does he want, don't want to offend anybody here, but he doesn't care about 50 Hail Marys from you. It doesn't do any good. I don't even know how it goes. My wife does because she grew up Catholic. But it's like you just, a priest tells you, yeah, go say, you know, 50 Our Fathers and 50 Hail Marys, and then you're good. It's like, really? That's what it takes? That's just saying the same thing over and over again. It's like a three-year-old child sitting in the car seat on a long road trip asking for a cookie a hundred times. Daddy, I want a cookie. Daddy, I want a cookie. Daddy. And it's like, okay, I said no the first 50 times. I'm not going to keep saying no, but it's no the next 50 times. But we can all fall into the trap of vain, meaningless, repetitious prayers. Warren Wiersbe is one of my favorite commentators, and he had a friend who told him this, and it's really important. He says, all of us have one routine prayer in our system, and once we get rid of it, then we can really start to pray. And that's so true. That's good. Because, you know, I do the same thing. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Blessed are my body in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, and you can go on with your day. But God doesn't want that. He wants us to speak to Him from our hearts. We're talking to God in heaven. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray for the same things more than one time, because, you know, the Word of Faith movement will say, well, if you ask for something more than once, that shows your lack of faith. So you can only pray it once and then believe it. Can't pray twice. Can't pray, th pray three times. That's a lack of faith. Really? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed three times the same prayer? Lord, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He prayed it three times. The Apostle Paul prayed the exact same prayer three times. Uh, first, 2 Corinthians 12, where he says, Father, you know, I got this thorn in the flesh. Will you please remove this from me? Three times he says he prayed, Lord, I'm begging you. He's pleading with him. Remove this thorn in the flesh. Three times. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. So it doesn't matter how many times you pray. The thing is, when you pray, whatever you're asking from God, be sincere in your prayer. Trust God to do what he knows is best for you. In a moment, we're going to look at what we call the Lord's Prayer, but it's basically an outline for how we can pray. But even the Lord's Prayer can become vain repetition. I've known people over the years that'll turn that. Well, I say the Lord's Prayer, you know, 10 times before I go to bed. Well, why? What is that? Are you trying to get something from God by just repeating something to Him? It's not like there's some magical thing about just saying these words. In fact, Jesus didn't even tell us, say these words after me. No, he says, pray in this manner. It means this is an outline. This is an example of how we can seek the Lord and put things in our mind. So you avoid vain repetition. The Lord's Prayer can become like a Gregarian chant, you know, if you just repeat it over and over again. You know, my mom was funny. You know, she, she got saved when she was about 72 years old. And that was a miracle from the Lord after my dad passed away, and then she came to the Lord. Before that, when I was a new believer, I got saved, and I'm talking to her about the Lord, and she's like, oh, I'm good with God. It's like, really? No, you're not. You know, she was not even close to knowing the Lord, but she, I'm good with God. It's like, well, how do you say that? Why do you say that? Because I can say the Apostles' Creed. Okay, and then she'd rattle it off. And, and I was like, well, that's pretty impressive. Do you know what it means? Well, no, but, and she'd say it again. And like, you don't even know what this means. It's a great thing to say but you don't even know but she could rattle it off it's amazing but she didn't know the lord so we don't want prayer to be some formula and that's what jesus will talk about here in a moment verse 8 therefore do not be like them 
with the vain repetitions and all this stuff. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So don't be like those who don't even know the Lord. Realize that your Father in Heaven loves you. He knows everything about you. He's simply wanting you to enter into that close, intimate relationship with Him. And remember, there are thousands of people on this hillside listening to Jesus, and they must have been hanging on to every word He's saying here because they've been taught by these Sadducees and Pharisees, you can't approach God, you know, unless you sacrifice a bull and a goat and a lamb and everything else. God doesn't want to hear from you. He's certainly not your heavenly Father. They're going to get on Jesus for that, just calling Him Father. They've never, they've never heard anybody speak like this. So he's giving them and us this beautiful outline for praying to our loving Father in heaven. The real Lord's Prayer, by the way, if you, because some people call this the Lord's Prayer, it's really in John 17. If you read through John chapter 17, that's where Jesus is praying on behalf of the 11 remaining disciples. And then he goes into praying for those who will get saved down the road, including you and me. So it's really the Lord's prayer for us. This is an example of how we should pray to the Lord. This outline is to keep us from praying with vain repetitions. So an interesting thing is about two years after the Sermon on the Mount, one of the disciples come to Jesus and two years later says, Lord, teach us to pray. This is in Luke chapter 11. I must have thrilled his heart because they weren't saying, teach us how to heal, just like you do. There's no school of healing, by the way, even though there's a sign out there that says, we've got a school of healing or a school of prophecy. There's no school of prophecy, by the way. You either have the gift or you don't. God either works through you or he doesn't. You can't train somebody to heal other people. God does it you know, individually through whoever. I've laid hands on people and God has healed them. I've laid hands on people and they got worse and died doesn't mean I don't have the gift of healing or I have it. I don't. But God can give gifts of healings through anybody at any time. So you can't train for these things. But they're not asking that. They're saying, Lord, teach us to pray. They've been watching Jesus in communication with His Father, constantly praying. It must have thrilled His heart. How did He teach Him to pray? He uses the exact same outline here in Luke chapter 11. So again, it's an outline. He's not saying, pray these words after me. As many of you have probably discovered over the years, it's after we pray and seek the Lord for wisdom and discernment, for strength, for grace, for encouragement, whatever you need. You come away from that, and then the Lord can use you to minister to somebody else who needs that encouragement, who needs that word of wisdom, who needs that you know, love and compassion. But it's after we, we've been in fellowship with the Lord. So in prayer, we seek the Lord, we worship the Lord, we praise the Lord, and we receive from the Lord all that we need for today. And we should always come to the Lord with a, a thankful heart. After all, He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Well, look at verse 9. So He says, again, In this manner, therefore, pray. He's not saying repeat these words, but in the, this is an outline is what he's saying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. First of all, Jesus teaches us that true prayer is based on the fact that you and I, if you're saved, have a genuine relationship with our Father in heaven. We're his sons and daughters. Nobody can call God Father and, and the Father respond unless they have been born again into the family of God. This is so important because if you're not born again, if you're not saved, you can call God by any name you want to and He's not going to listen to you. You have to come humbly and ask for forgiveness. Receive Him as your Lord and Savior. Then you're born again. Then you have this relationship with the Father in heaven. So this is what it says in John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received Him, that's Jesus, to them He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in His name. And so we are His children. He is our Father. In fact, I, I love these verses in Romans 8, starting in verse 15, because this is how intimate Paul's relationship was with his heavenly Father. He says, 
For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. This is when you're saved. You're born again. He doesn't give you a spirit of fear and bondage. But you received the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of adoption. You've been adopted into the family of God. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. What's the word Abba? That means Papa, Daddy. He's not saying, I'm some distant God, and you're going to bow down to me, and I'm going to toast you if you do things wrong. No, he's like, no, I'm your papa, I'm your daddy, I'm your father who loves you. He knows how weak we are, but his throne room of grace is open 24-7 to all of us who will humble ourselves and come before him. He says, we cry out, Abba, Papa, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so if you are a child of God, you have this relationship with our Father in heaven. That's the next part of that verse. Our Father, where does He dwell? In heaven. That's where we're going to spend eternity with the Lord, in heaven. That's where Jesus is preparing a place right now for His bride. He says, I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, in glory. In Revelation 21 and 22, we have a little glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. That's the New Jerusalem that Jesus is preparing a place for us there. At the center of New Jerusalem is the throne of God. That's where the Father and the Son sit upon this throne. We like to read the parts about, oh, yeah, that's where the streets are paved with gold. You know, the walls are crystal clear, but it's made of precious jewels. That's where the tree of life is going to be producing fruit. That's great. You know, this is where the, uh, the river of life flows from the throne of God throughout New Jerusalem, which is like a 1,500-mile cube. Amazing. We like to focus on that, but the only reason it's so glorious is because that's where the Father and the Son will dwell. And this is what it tells us in Revelation 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, speaking of all of us who will be there. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So our Father in heaven. Look at the next part of verse 9. It says, Hallowed be your name. So we should praise and thank the Lord for His name. Hallowed simply means holy or set apart is His name. In other words, his name is unique. His name is different than any other name. You know, we say, well, what's God's name? Well, Yahweh, there's a lot of different names given to him in the Old Testament. It says in uh, Philippians 2, 9 and 10 that, you know, Jesus Christ has the name that is above every other name, that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So his name is above every name. Now in the Bible, name, uh, when you see names in the Bible, they always reveal someone's nature and character. You remember when Moses it says he wanted to see God's face? That's a great request. I'd love to see God's face. God says, nobody can see me and live. In other words, if you saw my face, you would be vaporized in an instant, Moses. But I'm going to reveal my name to you. And this is what it says, Exodus 33, 19. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Take note of that, the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And then it tells us that God takes Moses, puts him in the cleft of a rock. So he's on a cliff. He sticks him up in this little cave area. And he says, when I pass, he's going to put my, I'm going to put my hand over that. When I pass by, you're not going to see my face. You'll see my backside. Just a glory from what I'm leaving behind. Because you can't. You'll get vaporized. So, But I'll proclaim my name to you. And this is how he proclaims the name of the Lord. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And the Lord passed before him, before Moses, and proclaimed. This is where he proclaims the name of the Lord. Here's his name. The Lord. That's Yahweh. The Lord God. Here's his name. Merciful and gracious. Here's his name, long-suffering or patient and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. 
So any way you slice up sin, he's willing and able to forgive you of your sin. The sin nature you were born with and all the stuff you've done on your own. Um, and then here's his justice. He reveals his justice. This is part of his name as well. By no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. It's in the Ten Commandments where he qualifies that by saying, to those who hate me. There's judgments coming on those who hate me. But God will also reveal to us that that, that, that generational curse can be broken Anytime somebody turns to Christ, there's no generational curse after that. Jesus became a curse for us when he hung on the tree, when he hung on the cross. That's what Galatians 3 tells us. That curse is broken the moment you come to Christ. People are trying to label me. Oh, you have a generational curse because your you know, dad was this way and, you know, and his dad was this way and you can go down the line. It's like, not on me. Not when I came to Jesus. Old things pass away. Behold, all things became new when I became a new creation in Christ. So what a glorious name our Father has, Lord or Yahweh. What's the name of Jesus? Yeshua, which means Yahweh's salvation. So Jesus is the Lord's salvation. So when you pray, you think of these different things. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your name is awesome, Lord. Thank you so much for you know, revealing your name, your nature, your character to me through your word. So it's not just saying these words, but it's opening up more and more of the scriptures to us. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as we pray, we should always remember that this world is not going to be here forever. The clock is winding down. The great tribulation will come. There'll be seven years where it's going to be God's wrath poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. It's on the brink of annihilation. Jesus said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. How is it shortened? When Christ returns at a second coming, and we come back with Him. It says, riding on white horses. We come back with the Lord. Then he brings an end to all the chaos. He brings an end to the battle of Armageddon. He brings an end to all the destruction of the Antichrist. He throws the Antichrist and the false prophet in the lake of fire. And then he establishes his kingdom for a thousand years. So we're praying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a good thing to long for, to see the Lord ruling and reigning. Because right now, the wickedness of this world is just out of control. And it's sad to see so many people that are being put to death for their faith. You know, Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation that comes from the world, that comes from the flesh, it comes from the devil. It doesn't come from the Father. The great tribulation is God's wrath. We're not destined for wrath as we saw there in 1 Thessalonians 5.9. But the cry of the Old Testament martyrs, the cry of the New Testament martyrs, the cry of the tribulation saints, it can all be summed up by these words in Revelation 6, verse 10. These are those who were slaughtered at this time. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? God is going to avenge. He is going to establish His kingdom. And so Jesus encourages us to pray, to acknowledge this fact, God's kingdom is coming. So we should be watching, we should be ready, but in the meantime, pray for God's will to be accomplished on earth. You know, pray for your friends that don't know the Lord. Pray for those who are rejecting Christ. Pray for our leaders, as hard as that is sometimes. Peter says, pray for those who are in authority over you. Okay, I'll pray for Hayden Biden. All right, it's not fun, but I'll do it. Okay, God wants us to pray. He needs Jesus. People need Jesus. How can we make sure that we're living out God's will on earth? By living according to and praying according to the Word of God. That means we need to be careful to not get tossed to and fro by all the lies and the worldly philosophies of the unbelieving world around us. But this is not God's kingdom on earth. 
His kingdom is a spiritual kingdom that's growing as people come into the kingdom of God as they get saved. But his literal kingdom is coming in the future. But this is what Jesus says to Pontius Pilate when he's being questioned by Pilate. John 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews but now my kingdom is not from here. But again, when he does come back, and we come back with him, he will set up his glorious kingdom that will last for 1,000 years. So your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Look at verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Listen, when our heart is right with God, when we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then we can pray and trust that the Lord will meet our daily needs. And more than just daily food and bread, a daily meal, what we really need is to feed upon the daily bread of life, Jesus Christ. He's the true bread. He's the true manna that came from heaven. Even though God fed the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness, remember, manna from heaven every day, Moses was probably getting tired of writing the, the recipe. Let's see, manicotti, banana bread. I mean, going through the list, and the people are grumbling and complaining, and Jesus comes on the scene in John 6 and says, I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. I'm the one that sustained you in the wilderness. It wasn't the manna. Moses didn't do this. It was the Lord. But because of their rebellion against the Lord, grumbling, complaining about the manna, every single one of those Jews, 20 years old and above, for 40 years, they died out in the wilderness because they did not enter in because of unbelief. Only two entered into the promised land. Remember, Joshua and Caleb. They're the only two that entered in. Whoever receives the true manna from heaven, Jesus Christ, we enter into God's rest, His eternal rest forever and ever. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So one of the most important things we need to do in order to keep the lines of communication open as we pray and seek the Lord is to ask the Lord to forgive us when we sin. In other words, if I'm harboring bitterness or hatred towards someone, guess what I'm doing? I'm grieving the Spirit. I'm quenching the Holy Spirit. Oh, sure, I'm still a child of God. Our Heavenly Father still loves us. But if I harden my heart towards others, He will not hear our prayers. It's that simple. Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Peter tells husbands in 1 Peter 3, that if you're not living with your wife with understanding... If we're not honoring our wives, he says, your prayers will be hindered. 1 Peter 3, 7. How do you hinder your, your prayers as a believer, as a child of God? And the Father's like, no, I'm not going to listen to you right now. Because you're hardening your heart towards others. You're not giving forgiveness to others when they've asked you to forgive them of their sin towards you. And just as Jesus has forgiven us, we need to walk with an attitude of forgiveness. I love what Paul or Peter says here, 1 Peter 4, 7 and 8. But the end of all things is at hand. Wow, he said that 2,000 years ago. How close are we now? Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. If you're not willing to forgive somebody when they've sinned against you, there's no love in that. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus. And so we need to be willing to forgive. Verse 13, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So the result of being in prayer with our Heavenly Father, casting all of our cares upon Him, receiving what He has for us, is that we can go forth into this world with strength, with confidence that God will not lead us into sinful situations. Satan will. He'll try to lead us into sin sinful temptations. 
But even when he comes with those temptations, we can resist him. We can defeat him as we stand strong on the Lord and, and the power of his might. As we use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to keep him at bay. We don't need to give in to his temptations. We've been given all that we need for life and godliness. And as we acknowledge at the end of verse 13 again, God's kingdom, His power, His glory will reign forever and ever. And because we are in Christ, we're fighting from victory. We're not fighting for victory. The battle's already been won. And again, all of this is based on the fact that God the Father is our Father, and we are His children. And we have a love relationship with Him. So let's wrap it up here, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now this is very important because some Christians get tripped up by this. They question, I don't know if I'm saved. Maybe I'm not forgiven because there may have been somebody I didn't forgive and they hurt me and wronged me and they asked for forgiveness. And at the time, my heart was hard. And I said, no, that mean I'm not a Christian? No, he's not talking about this situation. This is in the context of fellowship with our Heavenly Father. This is not referring to salvation. In other words, salvation is not the reward for our actions. You don't get saved because you forgave somebody. You get saved because God has forgiven you of all of your sins. Nobody gets saved because we forgave somebody else. God's salvation is a free gift by God's grace. So again, this is all about fellowship with our Father. It's not right to think that we can go to our Father, we can ask Him to forgive us of some horrible things that we've done, and then we're refusing to forgive someone else who says, Pastor Jeff, I'm sorry I said this about you. Would you please forgive me? If I said, no, I'm not going to forgive you, then I'm quenching the Spirit. I'm grieving the Spirit. But when we experience God's grace and forgiveness, that should be enough for any of us to say, of course I forgive you. How could I not forgive you? Look at what God has forgiven me of. And if God could forgive me of all this, I'm certainly not going to withhold forgiveness when you ask me to forgive you for what you did to me.